Is this it? Is this how it ends? Did it even matter? The sweat, the blood, the early mornings and long nights. Did it all really lead to this? Is this all I get? Is this all I got? Nah, it can't be it. This thing ain't over. I might get hit. I might get knocked down. But I won't stop. I won't quit. I have to fight. Not because I'm afraid of losing, but because of what's inside of me. It's what I was made for. I fight like I know I've already won. Because I can't win if I don't fight. I want to stand 100 feet tall. Your name is a light that the shadows can't deny. There's this difference between what we want and who God is and how he would he is. Those are similar in a lot of ways, but I stand in the gap and I don't know how to do what it is I'm called to do, what I want to do, and what I see God doing. Standing in the darkness, being light that the shadows can't deny. I get those kind of gap mix up. I'm trying to figure out how it is that I do what I want to do, how I live it out. Hey, my name is Jeremy, and I'm thrilled um, just to be here today, to be a part of what God's doing at Journey. Um, it has been the highlights of the stories of, of Sheila and I's ministry years. I mean, we just are thrilled to be a part of this story. But I want you to know something. If you're here for the first couple of times, my guess is you've got some questions. If you were here for the last week, you were you're like, man, I don't know, Katy Perry one week, you know, Keith Urban a couple of weeks ago, and now that. That's crazy. So we have a lot of fun around here, and I want you to know something about the group of people that you're around. This is not a group of people that used to be people like you. And we're not a group of people who tolerate people like you. And we're not a group of people who try to fix or change people like you. We don't have any power over your life. We're not, we, don't, we can't fix or change anybody. We're just a group of people trying to figure out how to take our next step toward Jesus. We're also a group of people who know that we have a fight on our hands. And we see it every day in our lives, every single day, that we, we see stuff that goes on in our life where we are really, really aware as a group of people that we have an enemy that opposes us at every opportunity, at every opportunity. He's always been in our way. It's the reason why we live life in such tension all the way, trying to navigate. Why am I, why am I meeting such tension that in, in a way when I'm trying to do something good and I meet something terribly difficult? Any of you have ever tried to start giving in your life? Recognize that, right? The minute you get the checkbook out and you're like, okay, God, I'm going to put you first in my life. And we begin to write that check and we go, okay, I'm going to serve you first. And man, the minute you let go of that joker, it's like all hell unleashes, right? All of a sudden, you know, like things that were never a problem in your life are now a huge problem, you know, because everything that we do is opposed. Now, my guess is if you've grown up around church at all, you've been around this story at all, if you've been in church at all, at some point in your life, you've heard about Paul's words. Paul talked about the, uh, the, the armor of God. And at some point, you've probably heard a sermon, maybe even two or three, on, on the armor of God. And, and as I was getting ready for today, and I'm, I'm looking at this and I'm going, man, this is what we're going to teach about. And I know this is a good thing. I know this is important. It's important in my life. I pray this stuff for my family and for our church every single day. I just pray it. I put on the armor of God. We're going to talk more about that in a minute. It's something that matters in my life personally. But man, as I was looking at it this week, I'm like, man, I don't want to, I don't want to spend a half an hour just saying the same thing everybody else says, you know, because we've probably heard that, or you can even read it. Because here's the thing that is true about church in general, is that pastors, maybe it's unintentional, I don't know, or maybe it's intentional, I can't tell. But sometimes we have a tendency to make things more difficult than they really need to be. The Bible's written in English, and they sell it at Walmart, okay? It can't be that hard to understand. So it's, it's just available. You just read it, and it makes sense. And sometimes it takes a little sorted out. I get it. But it, it's nothing that every one of us aren't capable of doing. And so I thought, man, what, why say things that are so obvious? Say things that are, are so clear just by just 
reading through it. So, and to be honest with you, this is one of those times where it became real obvious that this is not my area of training, right? I didn't go to school to be a preacher. I, I went to school to be a youth pastor, which amounted to I have the degree that lets me teach high school if I want it, okay? So like, I don't know how to teach all this stuff. So like some pastors, they know how to put together a sermon and do this stuff. I just do this because this is what God calls me to do. So when we get to something like this, I'm like, this is going to feel a lot more like teaching than it is like preaching or speaking, and I don't really know what to do all this stuff. But I just think we could spend a little bit of time in Ephesians chapter 6, and as we walk through this, I think that you'll see what I saw, that there's something more here than just telling us about the armor that you and I should wear, about just more than just wearing what we're supposed to wear, because we know what it does, or we can read that and kind of figure out, okay, that's what this does, and that's what this does for me. But I think there's something deeper. And as I was looking at it this week and just studying it and thinking, man, where do I want to see me learn? Where do I want my heart to be taught? What do I need to see in this passage that I haven't seen maybe before? And I was noticing real quick that the armor not only tells us something about God and tells me, about, tells me something about me and what God wants for me, but it also tells us something about the enemy that we're fighting, about the reason that we have trouble between standing up 100 feet tall and where we actually live. And I feel like I'm knocked on the ground all the time. We, we learn something really quickly about the enemy that we stand against as we read the armor that God gives us to put on. And I wanna, I'm want to be honest with you. Every morning I get up in the morning, I spend some time with God. And at the end of that time, I do my very best to pray through putting on the armor of God for my house, for my family, for me personally. And I want us to understand something. As we unpack this a little bit, you're going to begin to see that this isn't just a concept. This isn't a, a metaphor. This is something real. And it starts in verse 10. It says this, a final word. I love that because it's, you know, Paul says a final word and then he gives, you know, like a page and a half. So a final, he must have been a preacher. So a, a final word, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on, the, put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities in the unseen world against mighty powers in the dark world and against evil in, in heavenly places. Now listen, I want us to get something. Like, that stuff freaks me out, okay? Like when I read that stuff, I get a little like, ooh, you know? Because I always kind of heard the, the armor of God is like a metaphor, right? You know, this is this and this is this and it's more figurative than it is real and, and all that kind of stuff. I grew up kind of things because we skipped, my church anyways, we skipped right down to 13. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor and we skip right down into that stuff. We don't really talk about these preceding few verses because I grew up Baptist, okay? Some of you, you know, grew up Baptist with me and you understand because I see the twitch in your eye. So like, like, like you grew up Baptist, like I, we didn't talk about that stuff because these things were the spiritual warfare stuff and that's what the charismatics talked about. And, and like, we didn't trust them. You know, we didn't talk about the Holy Spirit. We didn't talk about spiritual warfare. We didn't talk about that stuff because the Holy Spirit was like your drunk uncle. You never know what he's going to do. Well, if he shows up, things are going to go crazy. So let's just leave him out. We'll talk to him later by ourselves, okay? So, but like, we leave that stuff out. But man, when you read this, it becomes really obvious. Paul doesn't think this is a metaphor. Paul's not talking about about this armor of God that you put on, like it's, like it's kind of a, a figure of speech. I mean, because he's not, if, he, if he's talking about putting on armor of God as if it's a figure of speech, then you have to take this stuff as a figure of speech. I mean, look at what he says. Put on the full armor of God so that we can stand firm against all strategies of the devil, not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against rulers and authorities in the unseen world, against mighty powers in the dark world, and against evil spirits in heavenly places. Can I get something through our heads? That if, if Paul says that, this, that the armor of God is kind of a metaphor, and it is the way we stand against <laughs> not flesh and blood enemies, evil rulers, authorities in the unseen world, and against mighty powers in the dark world, and I get a metaphor to fight them? <laughs> like, 
Yay! <laughs> I can't wait, you know? No wonder we're all cowering in the corner. No wonder more Christians than not fail miserably in the idea of fighting our enemy because we're fighting with a freaking metaphor. Like, that's ridiculous. He's telling us with clarity that we are putting on, and I don't get this stuff. I don't understand it. I don't even claim to get the idea of it, but it's in English, right? He's telling us that something about this armor allows us you and I, regular, everyday people, the church at Ephesus, the church at Journey, the same people, gives us the ability to fight in another realm. I'm telling you, this stuff freaks me out, okay? So like, when, when we watch this stuff unfold, you go, man, there's something more to this whole Christian life than just you know, believing in Jesus and minding my manners until I'm dead, right? Just trying my best and not do things bad. Those are good things, but there's more to it. God didn't just save us from our sin. He saved us for a mission. And that mission, folks, is to stand against evil and to carry the name of Jesus into the darkness where there's no shadow that can deny him. That's powerful stuff. It's not just personal. It's a battle. So understand something. I think as we unfold this, every single piece of the armor of God tells us a little bit about who we're fighting about, a little bit about what's going on. So verse 14 is where it kind of under starts unfolding. It says, stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. That's what that's a big statement. Put on the belt of truth and the body armor. I like that better than, you know, the breastplate of righteousness. Because the breastplate of righteousness, when I hear that phrase, I don't understand it because it kind of harkens back to like a Roman soldier's uniform. Okay? So when I hear the breastplate of righteousness, I get the translation. It's accurate. But I like this one because it makes some sense to me because I understand body armor. I understand what it looks like because I've seen all the cop shows you could possibly imagine, right? Body armor protects what's important. Now understand something a little bit about this whole belt of truth thing. What he's talking about here it isn't just like a, a cute belt. I have had this Levi's belt. It's a leather belt, black leather belt. I've had this thing since we got married, okay? Like I've had to let it out. But like, like it used to, used to be tighter than it is today, but I've had this thing forever and it just lasts forever. But he's not talking about like a little two inch belt here. What, what the King James, and just so you know, like when you unfold other, all these different translations, they're unfolded, they're like translated at different times along the way. And, and some of them are word for word translations where they take one word out of the Greek or one word out of whatever language, Aramaic, or one word out of the Hebrew, and they translate it directly to English. And then there are other ones that are phrase by phrase renderings. Because when you translate right from Greek to English, it, it can, you can get a little clumsy, and that's why the King James is that and the fact that it was written in 1611. But, like, you know, that's why it can get so hard to read at times because it's it not only Old English, but it's also one word, you know, word for word translation, and it can get a little clumsy to read. So, pre, so ones like this one, the New Living Translation, take clumps of words in like two or three words, and they get the idea and they put them together one at a time. The most accurate way to understand God's word is to read it one word at a time. The hardest way is also to read it one word at a time. But the way that the King James translated that old one, the, the way it translates is to gird your loins with the belt of truth. Now you're starting to get a little bit better picture, right? This isn't just a cute little belt. It's not just a thing where all the stuff straps to. It's not just that one little piece. It, you get what I'm saying? Like, it, this is literally like Paul saying, look, the enemy fights you, put on a cup. This is going to be rough. Like, that's what he's saying. And, and, and what we learn when we understand this is that you've got to cover everything that's, in, you get what I'm saying? Everything that's important to you, the, the body armor, the whole deal has to be covered because the enemy fights dirty. And that's something we have to understand. The belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness or the armor of God's righteousness, however you want to put it, that tells us that the enemy fights dirty. You and I see this every day. This morning I woke up. I woke up at like before five o'clock, which if nothing else proves the existence of evil. So I get up and I'm like before five, I get my stuff together and I head out and I'm getting ready. And I'm, you know, I'm looking at our kids' location because all of our kids, 23 of our kids headed 
This morning at 3.45, I think it was, they met here at the building. Chuck and some kids slept the night here, right? Or stayed up or whatever they did the night. 3.45 this morning, they left to go to New Orleans. And I look, and I'm, they're supposed to be getting close to gone, and they're still at the train station. And I'm like, what's going on? So I waited, and I thought, well, maybe it just hasn't updated. So I called later and did all this stuff. Well, it turns out they got there. They've been waiting for three hours, and the train's late and all this stuff. And so right off the bat, you know, you got 23 kids. Did I just drop some? You got 23 kids who are, who are terrified and, and a little anxious, and they've been up late, and they're, you, can you imagine? I mean, God is sovereign in keeping me here. I'm too old for student ministry now. So, like, God is so good, but he got these kids that are, they're, they're tense, you know, I, I can hear it in my kid's voice, you know, and, and I know they're tense, but here's the deal. The enemy's already beginning already beginning to fight them on every level, ways they weren't expecting, because he doesn't fight fair. He, he organizes and orchestrates things in our life that pierce, and then we get here, right? And the band has all kinds of technical difficulties. I mean, there's all kinds of little things. This doesn't work. Why isn't that working? Hey, try to plug this, and run that, figure this thing out. They're terrified they're doing this song to begin with, because they're like, this is aggressive, you know, like, and they know it. They're like, man, I would think this is a good thing, but they're terrified of it. I, you know, I, a family crisis, not ours, but someone else's family this morning erupts, and I spent a little bit of time with them and working through some of their stuff this morning. All the while, I'm going to open up Ephesians 6 and preach about spiritual warfare. He, our enemy doesn't fight clean and fair, so we need God's armor. So here's the thing. I'm going to just encourage you this. This week, for this whole week, just put on the full armor of God. One, one, one piece at a time every day this week. Just pray. God, I want to put on the spiritual armor that you've given me. I want to, give, I want to fight in another realm. I want to put on the, breast, the, the belt of truth and, and the body armor that is your righteousness. And I want you to do this. Pray for courage. That's what it gives you. This, this kind of garb around the middle, of your, the middle part of your body, the critical mass of your body, that part of your body is protected because our enemy doesn't fight fair, but you're going to need courage. This armor gives you courage to be able to step into fight. Then the next verse goes on a little bit, and it, it says, For shoes put on the peace that comes from the good news that you will be fully prepared. I don't know that I'm ever fully prepared. Because when I look back at this verse, you know, when I look back on those previous verses, I see that our enemy, our enemy is organized there's rulers and principalities and evil spirits and there's all these, there's like hierarchy and I'm like, I'm terrified going into this. Now I know that this breastplate of righteousness, this, you know, this body armor, this girding your loins with, you're covered and it gives you some courage, but, but man, I'm not ready because it seems like he's coming at me all over the place. Because here's the problem we sometimes get with these shoes things is we have a tendency to go, oh, that's like sandals, you know? Put your sandals on. I don't know about you, but I don't want to fight in sandals. I don't want to mow the lawn in sandals, right? Like, I, I don't want to do anything in sandals. And I don't want us to think like, I don't want us to think like tennis shoes either. These are vans, you know? I wouldn't want to fight in vans either. I wouldn't want to fight in sandals. I wouldn't want to fight in vans. And when we get a glimpse of, of what Roman soldiers' shoes look like, you'd understand they were more like boots. And they were, they had nails driven through the bottoms of them because the intent was that they could not only not only stand firm and hold their ground well but they could also push off in any direction because the enemy that you and I fight comes at us from every direction and you see this right comes at us financially he comes at, at us relationally he comes at us through our kids he comes at us through through our work he comes at us he comes at us in every way he comes at us through our lousy car we could buy the great car we're like this is perfect it's new it shouldn't have any problem mhm mm right it shouldn't right i'm going i'm do, i'm going to church i'm doing the right thing i'm giving i should be free of problems now yeah sure we see this all the time don't we our enemy your enemy you see it in your life i don't have to tell you this stuff you see this all the time these shoes give us readiness. I mean, it's like what he's saying is, is simply this. Hey, don't take your shoes off. Don't, don't get relaxed. Don't, get, don't kick back and take it easy. Keep your shoes on because we may have to run at any moment. We understand that our enemy comes at us at any time from any direction, and he does not fight clean. Passage goes on. In addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith, 
to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Fiery arrows. Where's an arrows enough? <laughs> like, like you kind of you ever seen people like they, they, they have a fiery arrow and they shoot them at you in in war, like on a movie. And I always wonder, man, I mean, like a flying sticky spear, you know, that's not enough. I got to have fire on it. You know, like we add this thing. What it tells me, what I recognize is that the enemy's not just looking for one, one injury in our life. Do you see what's going on? He's looking for multiple levels of injury. He doesn't just want to pierce your life. He wants to burn you. He doesn't just want to hurt you. He wants to destroy you. Do you get what he's doing? He's not just looking for an, an, an issue, a wound today. He's looking for you to make an agreement over time. We've talked about this before. There are times in our lives where if we're not careful, we wind up getting to a place where, where we're, we make agreements with the enemy. I, I know that doesn't seem like it. You're like, oh, I'd never agree with the enemy. That's ridiculous. Let me ask you this. You don't have to raise your hand. Do you feel beautiful, ladies? No? Because at some point, the enemy whispered in your ear that you weren't beautiful. And you agreed. And that's why I struggle today. Guys, let me just ask you this question. Do you feel like you have what it takes? I mean, do you feel confident in your leadership? Do you feel confident in your sexuality? Do you feel confident in being who you are as a man? Why not? You don't have to tell anybody, because I know we, we don't tell people that stuff, right? Especially good, I'm, I'm in almost a decade now. We're good Southern men now, okay? Like, <laughs> like, we don't tell people that stuff, right? We don't tell people that we're, that we're insecure. We don't tell people that we're a little bit worried about something. We don't tell people we struggle with lust. We don't tell people those things, right? Because, because it doesn't make us look good. But the truth is, every single guy in this room, not one of us, is off the hook. Why do you feel that way? Because at some point, the enemy told you you didn't have what it took. And you didn't know better than to disagree. You didn't know better than to stand up. And he placed a wound deep inside of you. You made an agreement, and over time, it played out in your life. These shoes, man, they give us the potential to be ready to fight that deep wounding that comes when he looks for two wounds or three or four wounds. Not just darts. Not just arrows, but fiery darts, fiery arrows that wound in one place and in another, and they hurt in a double way. Understand something, that's, it's not a figure of speech. It's real in our lives. It's the reason we don't feel valuable. It's the reason we don't feel loved. It's the reason that we don't feel like we have what it takes. It's the reason we don't feel like we're strong enough or like we're not one of the guys or we're like we're going to always be on the outside. It's the reason why we feel like we're late. Those are my story, not yours. They can be your story if you want, but the truth is those are mine. So here's the question. Are, are we willing to put on this armor and stand strong against the efforts of the enemy? Because you and I have a fight to fight. We're called to this. God, has, it requires it of us. We stand there and we will either fight. We're in the fight. doesn't really matter. So we'll either fight or we'll just get rolled over, which explains a lot in our life, doesn't it? I don't know about you, but I'm tired of getting rolled over. I want to fight. I want to take new ground. I want, I want to stand strong. I, I want to make sense out of these things, these feelings that I have. I want to live them out. I, I don't want to sit on the sidelines and just get rolled over anymore. Last thing. In addition to all these things, take up the shield of faith and stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Man, that's a powerful idea. You know that, that salvation helmet? I, I always thought that it was like, put on the helmet of salvation. Okay, yes, I, I accepted Jesus. That's the, thing that, that thing, that's the thing that kind of protects me. I know I have a relationship with Jesus. I'm, that's what it is. That's not what he's talking about here. That's what's strange about it. Everybody agrees. When you read all of the stuff behind this whole thing, he's not talking about my salvation experience. 
He's not talking about the day that I raised my hand. I, I've been reading this book. It's so powerful to me, so valuable. And we're going to talk a little bit more about it in a second. But it's been so helpful to me because it's the, the biography of Eddie DeGarmo, which means little or nothing to you. But Eddie DeGarmo was the guy who explained the gospel to me in a way that made sense. And I raised my hand. I walked the aisle. And I remember at the front part of Edmund Chapel at, at, Wheaton, at Wheaton College, I was at the very front row. And I remember feeling like I'm just like, God... I give you my life. I'm not inviting you in. I'm giving it to you, and I don't want it anymore. I remember, I remember saying that this is the moment in my life where I, when the enemy comes back and questions me, I will always take him to the front row of Wheaton College, Edmund Chapel, and show him a blood stain on the carpet because this is where it happened for me. That's my story. And so there's this part of it, I'm reading this story, this book about, that kind of leads up to this thing. And I feel like I'm reading the prequel to my faith, you know, because I'm reading all the things that they went through and all this stuff. And it gets to this point, but I'm like, man, over the years, I've always had this question. How is it that this is supposed to protect me? The helmet of my salvation experience because sometimes I worry about it. I, I fret, is that really worth it? Is that really, is that really sta- stable? Is it something I really did? Is that I, I struggled with that for a long time. But this passage isn't talking about that. He's talking about the helmet of our salvation isn't our experience with salvation. It's not our giving of our life to Jesus. What he's talking about here is putting on the helmet of salvation, the helmet of the knowledge that one day this thing is all taken care of, that we are fighting a war that is already won. It's finished. It's just a matter of us fighting out the battle in our lives for the glory of God. And this is so powerful a piece of it to me. That if you and I are going to fight this thing, we have to understand that this helmet of salvation and the sword of truth, the sword of the spirit, remind us that the enemy's fighting a losing battle. He knows it. He already knows he's been defeated. He just wants to get a pound of flesh in the process. And you and I are that pound of flesh. And I don't want to give it to him. I'm tired of giving it to him. I'm tired of playing his game by his rules and getting bowled over. I want to fight a fight that God calls us to that's so much more valuable than the, than the story of me. Really, at the end of the day, the beginning part of warfare on a spiritual level, of spiritual warfare, is really about me trading in the lead story, the lead role in the story of me, and trading that in for a supporting role in the story of God. Because that's, that's really what's going on. I read this book this week, and, and it was just such a powerful story to me because I look back starting in like, you know, when they were in the first grade in like the late 50s, you know, and then they're telling their story of loving music and doing all this, and then the, the disappointments they'd have, and they try this record label, and the disappointments they'd have, and the whole time I'm knowing that one day there'll be a day when he's in Wheaton College at Edmund Chapel and explaining the gospel, and, and this 16-year-old kid who's an idiot will be listening. You know, and, and I know what happens. And I'm unfolding one page after another page and going, man, how does it ever work? I mean, they're driving around in a, in a truck from tour date to tour date, all five of them living in, in a truck, five smelly men and all their equipment and, and all this stuff. And I'm going, man, how does it ever get to this place? And I realized that. That God wasn't up in that story, wasn't painting a picture of Jeremy's salvation experience. God's painting a much bigger picture. My salvation experience is a brushstroke. And that's where the fight begins for you and for me. When we understand that we can take the lead role in our story, or we can trade that in for a supporting role in the grand story of God that's already finished. When we put on the helmet of salvation the sword of the spirit. When we move forward into battle, it's our choice to say, no, I will not fight for the little story of me. I'll trade in for the much bigger story of God's goodness and his glory because that's a fight worth fighting. Let me pray for you. Jesus, I am thankful to you that you don't ask us to fight this fight on our, on our abilities and 
our background. Man, we're just thankful that you don't give us just a metaphor to fight with. That you sincerely do give us the belt of truth and the body armor of your righteousness. We're thankful that you give us shoes fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit. God, we're so thankful for those those implements that allow us to front up the enemy. God, I just pray that you would give us courage, courage to fight strong, vigilance to know that we need to keep watching. The enemy comes from every angle. Lord, I just pray that you'd help us to see and have a kingdom mindset that helps us to understand that you've already won and that we fight our fight as a small part of your story. I ask that in your name. Amen.